Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a good break and that you enjoyed session one as much as I did. Great to see all of you back. Um, we're now on session two, which is the road to 2030, a call to action. I'm really happy to introduce Luther Clark, who's going to moderate this session. Luther is the Deputy Chief Patient Officer and Global Director for Scientific Medical and Patient Perspective at Merck and & Company. And Luther has been a dedicated member of our planning committee, which is overseeing uh, this work of, of the workshops, which has been going on for the last year. So it's really been a pleasure listening to Luther and working with him over this past year. And I think we're going to enjoy his moderation moderation of the this session. So take it away, Luther. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Stephen. And uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to uh, session two of today's workshop on envisioning a transformed clinical trial uh, enterprise for 2030. I'm really uh, delighted to have the privilege to uh, moderate this session uh, with you. And uh, I would just remind you that the goal of today's workshop, of course, is to uh, discuss achievable goals to enhance person-centeredness and inclusivity in the clinical trials uh, enterprise. And we're gonna begin this afternoon with three 10 minute presentations. Uh, the speaker bios are, are in the briefing book, so I'll just introduce them by name and uh, current uh, position. Uh, the first two presentations will address uh, North Star visions of what is possible. And the third, uh, a frontline experience, a road already uh, traveled. So it is really a, uh, a great pleasure to uh, introduce our first speaker, uh, Silas Buchanan, who's the Chief Executive Officer for, for the Institute for eHealth uh, Equity. Uh, Silas, uh, welcome, and uh, we uh, look forward to your, uh, your comments. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me, uh, team. The National Academies and Luther, it's good to hear your voice again. We saw on a panel, I think, a couple years ago. It's been, it's been a while. So. Uh, good to be reconnected, even though it is uh, through Zoom. Um, so good afternoon. Um, as stated, I'm Silas Buchanan. I'm CEO at the Institute for uh, eHealth Equity. Uh, very briefly, eHealth Equity is the name in FERS. Uh, we're concerned about an exacerbation of health disparities because of technology. So we spend quite a bit of time working with underserved communities and communities of color, uh, raising their literacy around the benefits of adopting and utilizing technology to improve health outcomes of individuals, families, and communities. On one side, on the other side, we spend quite a bit of time working with the ideators and innovators of, of health tech solutions to make sure that they're spinning things up in a culturally appropriate way um, and shortening the distance between their solutions and community, and thus shortening the distance between payer, provider, government, academic stakeholders, and underserved communities. Community. So, um, I, I did write a blog post to accompany this, this session today, and I hope you guys had an opp opportunity to read it. Uh, if, if not, I'm, I'm sure uh, it's available, and I hope you, you take a look. It's titled, uh, you know, Driving Towards a More Inclusive uh, Clinical Trials Enterprise by, by 2030, uh, with, with a colon, and then Action uh, Without Strategy is Aimless, and Strategy Without Action is Powerless. And, uh, you know, it, in part of it, I talk about how a more inclusive clinical trials enterprise in 2030 will largely be defined by the number of, of equitable partnerships, and I'll use those, those terms quite a bit here, uh, created with underserved faith and community-based organizations. And, and the path you know, to those potential partnerships begins uh, by building trusted uh, relationships with the leaders uh, of those organizations. And I, I call out this strategy specifically because you know, I believe that the Clinical trial enterprise historically has not fully understood uh, the importance of equitably engaging these organizations, or at the very least, underestimated the, the depth of trust that underserved community members have in these organizations and the critical role that they play as, as conduits or, or middleware uh, uh, pieces between underserved community members uh, and the healthcare system uh, inclusive of the clinical trial enterprise. Um, you know, when, when I was a kid, my, my dad 
uh, I remember called his his cousin. We couldn't afford a plumber. He called his cousin to fix a leaky pipe. And so he, he comes over and he changes the pipe and we could see it. It was all got brand new new piping and we, we closed the cover. Um, but, but what we didn't know uh, is that while he changed the piping, he didn't take time to buy just this new 20 cent washer, right? And so over time, uh, we wound up with a much bigger problem. And, you know, the fact that he didn't focus or understand the vital importance of that middleware piece, again, it caused a much uh, bigger problem for us. And so it's similar with understanding the critical importance of, of equity partner partnering with our trusted community-facing organizations, whether in community-wide vaccination campaigns or diabetes or asthma campaigns or the clinical trial enterprise. These partnerships, those sometimes seen as small or, or difficult to understand or get our arms around, or where do we start? You know, they're, they're critical to, to begin and to nurture, especially now, and especially as we move towards 2025 and 2030. So, you know, I, I, I don't mean, you know, in, in a kind of glib uh, way, hey, let's just go partner with the churches, because I hear that a lot. I'm just going to go partner with the churches, you know, kind of like, hey, kids, let's go put on a show. It's, it's we, we've done that in the past, and uh, it doesn't really work out so well. It has not worked out so well, particularly for uh, members of communities of color, nor the clinical trial uh, enterprise. So it's got to be much more than that uh, by by 2030 as we look towards 2030. Now, you know, most of us already know what health disparities are, health inequities, uh, social determinants of health, inclusive of uh, systemic racism. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time, you know, there. Uh, and, and frankly, I'm a bit tired of some of those conversations that you know, we consistently define and redefine these things without always proffering, you know, actionable solutions and especially around social determinants of health. And so it's part of the reason why we're, we're, uh, we're here today. However, um, I will point out and remind everyone in the audience that, you know, these community facing organizations and institutions, you know, have historically addressed social determinants of health. You know, us doing that in underserved communities and communities of color and rural communities is, is not new. And so, you know, if you think about it, you know, churches have always addressed food insecurity through soup kitchens and food pantries and still, you know, do so today. They've always provided rides via church vans to doctor's appointments. They've, you know, always collected and given away, you know, clothing to those in need and have always provided uh, daycare services for toddlers and after school uh, education programs for adolescents and even GED classes for young adults and adults. And, you know, so, you know, these organizations that are embedded in underserved communities are, are expert, excuse me, expert at addressing uh, social determinants of health. Um, you know, barbers and beauticians have, have always also been, been a place, and we heard this last week from uh, Reverend Terrace King, you know, where frank and safe conversations about our health uh, and health care or, or lack thereof, you know, takes takes place. You know, health happens, you know, in the community for good or, or bad. Um, it, it happens there, you know. So think, think about this, too. If you're relatively healthy uh, and you see a doctor maybe once a year for your annual checkup, you know, for, for 20 minutes, you see a doctor once, maybe twice a year for 20 minutes. But if you're a church going person, you know, you can spend about 70 hours a year in church, right? And even more than that, you know, at your, your barbershop or your, your, your beauty shop. So these people and institutions are, are the people that you know, like, love, and trust, and sometimes, you know, more so than your doctor, right? So we understand, you know, why these organizations are, are loved, but I do want to dig into, as we did in our breakout session, a bit about the, the how. I want to get to the, the, the how we begin to create a transformed and more inclusive uh, clinical trial enterprise as we move towards 2030. And it, it, it has to do, of course, as I've, I've stated, with, with how we more equitably knit these trusted uh, organizations into the workflow of healthcare systems and the clinical trial enterprise. Um, and so, to, to kind of get down the road on it, my organization decided to do a little bit less consulting um, and begin to put a little bit of our money where our mouth is um, and start building um, a, you know, more equitable uh, and inclusive uh, approaches, almost a methodological approach to underserved uh, community outreach and engagement to improve uh, health outcomes. And we started with the churches. Um, our first uh, our first shot over the bow was 
powered by a small grant from Aetna Foundation, oh, about five years or so ago. And, and we partnered with five churches in three cities, Atlanta, Dallas, and, and Columbus. So they were all, all over the place. They were disparate. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we launched a, a HEAL campaign, a Healthy Eating Active Living campaign. And we were careful not to fully bake you know, that campaign and then try and shove it, you know, down at the community and say, hey, look what we came up with. You guys should adopt this. We're going to tell you how to do it. No, we, we just approached them with the idea uh, of co-creating the campaign with them. So everything from the language and the verbiage we used um, uh, in the content. And by the way, this was about kind of an offline and an online approach because we have to respect the fact that not everybody, particularly five years ago, uh, is uh, was online as much as they, they are today. Um, the the pictures we use in the collateral material, it, it, it had to be blessed, you know, by those uh, participating faith-based organizations. And so what we drove uh, as part of this Healthy Eating Active Living campaign was an SMS-based uh, campaign. You know, the pastor got up on the pulpit, uh, chat a little bit about health, asked people to text healthy to our short code. And when they did that, just via SMS, we immediately began to ask a series of questions. Race, ethnicity, age, gender, zip code, do you smoke, are you insured, how do you rate your health, right? We then uh, began to touch these community members three times a week. Message, message around healthy eating, active living, and then a question. And at the, at the end of the day, the results, we had 2,500 participants over six months. We had a 43% response rate to questions that we asked. And maybe most importantly is we, we had zero opt-outs. Nobody left the program. But I will say, you know, the secret sauce, you know, after we got the pastor's blessing to push off on the from the dock on, on this program, was we met with the health ministers weekly and privately, right, to get feedback from them. You know, can we put an ad in the church bulletin? Um, do you need more hot cars to hand out in the pews? Um, should we produce a slide that can go behind the pastor so he's, well, he's in the pulpit? And so it was an agile approach powered by by them and things that they know um, that I would not have known because I don't go to any of those churches per se. So that led to a partnership with the AME Church. And many of you likely know AME is 2,000 congreg congregations and about 2 million uh, members worldwide. So in partnership with them, we launched uh, amechealth.org, and it has now become the official uh, health information dissemination channel uh, for, uh, for the AME Church. Now, you go to amechealth.org, and part of it is public facing, but, you know, per our lessons learned, part of it is password protected. It's a password protected social network just for the leadership of, uh, of, uh, of AME congregations. So that way we can equitably collaborate with them uh, on campaigns. And, and, you know, we did this in, in part um, for a lot of reasons. One, you know, whether it's American Heart, American Diabetes, American Cancer, they all have programs specifically designed to reach African-Americans in churches, but they're pulling all of the data uh, and the people onto their platform and they're not sharing the data back in a lay format that any of the faith-based organizations could use to apply for grants on their own. And so it's, it's an inequitable sort of system. So, you know, we, we approached them and said, let's build your, your own, and they were amenable. When we started, 15% of the AME churches had a, a dedicated health, health ministry team. And these typically are nurses or doctors or retired nurses and doctors that are, that are there in the church. Today, it's about 35% and, and, and rising. So, um, you know, we, we work closely with them. Uh, currently, we're working on a COVID uh, campaign as well as an, an Alzheimer's campaign. Um, you know, by the way, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that Reverend Dr. Uh, Marion Burnett knows that we're having a chat today. and She understands the importance of underserved community participation in the clinical trial enterprise and is, is interested in how we might move forward. So, so now um, we work more broadly uh, is, is our desire. We want to work beyond, you know, just, just AME, uh, much more secularly and non-secularly. And so we'll soon be launching our healthy community uh, uh, teams or OHC teams, uh, dot com as a social network for both faith and non-faith community-based uh, organizations, both uh, ur uh, urban and rural, uh, inclusive of, of barbershops, beauty salons, nail techs, corner stores, Right. We want to work with them, as I stated earlier, to shorten the distance between 
payer provider, government, academic stakeholders, and uh, those of us in the clinical trial uh, enterprises. Um, uh, we were recently selected by Morehouse School of Medicine to partner with them on their COVID campaign or the National Advisory Board um, for uh, the National uh, COVID-19 Resiliency Network, uh, which, is, uh, which is significant. Uh, but true to our model, um, we negotiated with Morehouse, even though they're a uh, historically black college uh, university, um, we negotiated that we would push out our own campaign. We'd co-brand it with them. But we've got to work directly with um, our faith-based organizations and make sure that they are on board and that they're a part of co-creating whatever we do. And so we're launching a bit of a sub-campaign, Let's Connect to Conquer COVID, so that we can get input from them prior uh, to uh, to launch. And people are excited about that. Um, and all of well, this- Silas, I'm getting uh, some uh, red flashes here. So if you could sort of wrap up. <laughs> Yep, yep, yep. All right, I'm on my way. Uh, so I will, I will conclude, right, uh, by sharing that, uh, you know, our communities and leadership, while, while still having trust issues with healthcare system generally and the clinical trial enterprise specifically, recognizes the importance of being engaged. What we're most interested in is helping to equitably, equitably connect all stakeholders, help recruit more PIs of color, and build something that acknowledges the past uh, and mistrust of the past while moving together towards the future. Thank you, sorry I ran over, thank you. No problem, well thank you so much. That was really uh, excellent and inspiring and I'm sure we'll generate some uh, discussion uh, in the uh, in the breakout. So so thank you so much for being with us and uh, and speaking. So our next uh, uh, presenter will be Marilyn uh, Metcalf, who is Senior Director of Patient Engagement at Galaxo Smith Klein. So well, Marilyn, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for uh, agreeing to speak and we look forward to your comments. Thank you, it's great to be here and uh, really enjoyed that presentation, Silas. I think this is gonna kind of come at it from the other end and I think we'll have a lot of, of areas to talk about in the middle. Um, so just wanted to start with the uh, usual disclaimer that this is um, my views and actually my co-author Rob's views, but uh, not meant to represent any organizations in particular. Um, we also were working on a blog together. Um, Rob is uh, my colleague and a patient advocate and uh, has also been open about his own experiences as a patient um, in, in public forums. And so we provided a vision of healthcare in 2030 that um, would essentially monitor a patient's well-being to the degree that they wanted to be monitored. Um, and use uh, artificial intelligence and digital networking and have this you know comprehensive, proactive, health service to the patient and the caregiver. And uh, so we started it with early detection of disease and then moving through shared decision making and psychosocial and financial support, um, expert medical care, and then a hoped for optimal outcome with as little added burden to the patient as possible. And this is based on a lot of patient advice that we get um, from uh, Rob, his colleagues, a, a lot of folks who advise us on what it's like right now to try and navigate the healthcare system. So we believe those technical capabilities um, to make that kind of a future reality actually already exist or are not far off, but that's especially true for patients who have access to specialty medical facilities and comprehensive insurance plans. Um, the infrastructure, the access, the equity, and for those who want it, the privacy and security uh, are not aligned yet for this future to be the norm or in, in healthcare. So we also want to consider patients who are not well insured, who don't have physicians, whose physicians don't have familiarity with or access to clinical trials and cutting edge therapies, as we've heard earlier. And these are all systemic needs that are not going to be met by just one part of the healthcare system in isolation. So our future is not about technical capabilities alone. Um, wearable devices and digital access are really only tools. They're more appealing to some patients than others, um, as well as accessible. And the really greater need in this whole vision is the healthcare system that's integrated in a shared purpose and shared information. So we think that better aligning priorities for patient involvement in medical product research and development and regulatory decision making for implementation for early disease detection, disease management, and treatment is going to create um, a more direct translation from research into practice. 
So our prior work in the Science of Patient Input Workshop had some suggestions for earlier involvement of patients in input into research and improved understanding of patient populations. So as trials are being designed, we're designing with those patients in mind, uh, having a better understanding of patients' experiences during and after the trials, and including the experiences of those who didn't stay in the trials. Um, and many of these ideas have actually come a bit more commonly into practice in the interim, but it's certainly not universal, as you've already heard earlier today. Those experiences did nudge us toward a closer partnership with patients and caregivers, and uh, it also made us more aware that we still have a long way to go to integrate a holistic, person-centered research uh, regulation, clinical practice, and payment system into this person-centered equitable system. But we also are more convinced than ever that creating an equitable person-centered healthcare system is not only possible, but absolutely necessary for the well-being of all people. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Marilyn, for that really uh, interesting, informative, uh, and, uh, and helpful uh, discussion, which I think will also generate uh, some uh, substance for discussion in our, uh, our breakout. So another uh, really informative uh, and inspiring uh, presentation. So our, our third uh, really brief uh, presentation uh, on will provide a frontline experience, a road already traveled. And our speaker is uh, Margaret Anderson, who's Consulting Managing Director of Strategy and Analytics at uh, Deloitte. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Margaret, and looking forward to your uh, your comments. Awesome. So I was super excited to hear about this meeting series and the effort that you guys are on undertaking and embarking upon. I would say for my entire career, and I would venture to say all of yours, um, we have been speaking about this issue. And, um, you know, it is one that I think the time is long past. And so let's let's take a little time travel journey together. Um, I'm starting here with just my own little montage and compilation of, you know, living through COVID, which I think it's a time capsule that we would all prefer to, uh, you know, kind of toss in the garbage can. But I do think it, it gives us some really interesting um, leverage, if you will, for advancing the system because things happen that we had no control about and we had to kind of retrofit what we were dealing with. So I'll go to the next slide. If you if you kind of envision this this time travel capsule that we're in, um, and you can go to the next slide, I really think that you first have to think about, you know, what is the context that we're doing all of this in? Silas, you were talking a bit about trust and kind of, you know, historical um, aspects of that. I would say in terms of the clinical trial system that we are talking about today and that we want to transform, this is not the system that we wish we had. It is the system that we do have, though. And so what I'm going to do is just touch on a few different movements that I have actually, you know, been working in over my career um, so that we can pull some lessons and you guys can take those into your breakouts. So next slide, please. So I think that you know, it's important that we take a pause constantly and reflect on um, not just why we have mistrust in the system, but, you know, things that have happened um, as an opportunity to reflect on what we don't want to see happen again. So I, I think, you know, there this slide doesn't do justice to, you know, what we have done in terms of, um, you know, sort of uh, unethical practices in medical research, um, but it does, you know, remind us of where we have been and also what communities, you know, still remember. And there are obviously many, many things that are not listed on a slide like this. Um, next slide, please. So I found this particularly interesting. You know, I've seen a number of presentations recently that are compiling data about trust. And so this is some work that the Pew Research Center has done. There's also a study by um, Edelman that I would encourage you to take a look at around trust. You know, if you look on the left side of the slide, uh, the important thing here to reflect upon is that this is not a novel situation in terms of mistrust. Um, this is obviously on the left speaking very kind of at a macro level and globally, but 
you know, look at the, the far left. In 1958, you had President Eisenhower, you know, sort of the post-World War II, um, you know, things were pretty high up there. And then you start to see this intense sort of slide down through a number of various, um, you know, sort of world events. Um, you know, and, and then you see, you know, towards the end, there's some spikes in terms of, you know, times that our nation has come together um, after 9-11, for example. Um, but I, I would say that trust sort of demise has been an ongoing phenomenon for some time. Interestingly, though, as I was kind of peeling through this data, if you look at the right hand side, I think that's actually quite important to note that the scientific community trust has been fairly, you know, kind of steady. Um, medicine has taken a bit of a dip, but I, I just think that's also important because as we project ahead about where do we want to see the clinical trials system moving, um, you know, we need to do a better job at explaining the uh, relative utility of clinical research to the practice of medicine and care. Um, that there is a direct correlation, and, and certainly that's been brought up. I know in the work that uh, you know, uh, Acting Commissioner Woodcock has been, you know, kind of widely sharing around uh, problems that have been seen more recently with COVID clinical trials. Uh, next slide. So quickly, in terms of the time capsule, uh, I wanted to bring up what we saw in terms of HIV/AIDS. And uh, this is an area that I, you know, had the opportunity and the privilege to work in. I worked at the American Public Health Association in the early days of the epidemic. Um, this was a case where you literally saw demonstrators and activists, um, you know, kind of seizing a bit of control in terms of the, the actions. And I'll talk a little bit about what were some of those actions that they took, because it's relative, it's relevant for um, another movement that I was part of in terms of women's health research, patient centricity, uh, and I think going forward. I do want to flag the the AIDS quilt. I asked a, uh, a friend of mine because I knew that his brother had passed away from HIV, and he shared um, the panel with the rainbow. And this is a panel that he organized uh, in honor of his brother. Um, and I, I sort of want to speak his name, uh, John Rocco Tizio. And, you know, he was just talking about it as if it were yesterday. And so back to the sort of historical mistrust and wrongdoings, I do want to remind us that there's deep pain, you know, throughout the research system. And these are real people, real lives, real um, diseases. Uh, and, you know, it, it's important for us to kind of honor that. So next slide, please. If we keep going in that time capsule, this is another area that I had the opportunity to work in. I went and worked at the Society for Women's Health Research. Uh, Phyllis Greenberger was the head of it. Florence Hazeltine was the, you know, sort of champion of this organization. And what you saw here was, was truly an inside out game. And what do I mean by that? That was a sort of a tactic that was pioneered in the, the HIV AIDS movement. Um, where there was the use of sort of public demonstration coupled with intense strategy and deep knowledge and understanding of what were changes that should happen. Uh, and the two went hand in hand in terms of accountability. And that's something I want us to be really paying attention to, because if we don't want to be sitting here having this conversation in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, I don't know if I'm going to be part of this uh, room at that point, but you know, there needs to be a bit of, you know, com combination effect in terms of what are we trying to get done and how are we holding not just ourselves accountable, but can different groups take different pieces of this to move things forward? Um, the good news is I have seen in my career just fantastic and breathtaking changes occur. So this slide represents this continuum where you had the exclusion of women of childbearing age in phase one and two trials. Then you had policies that were put in place to encourage that women be included in clinical trials. And um, a group of advocates went to Congress to women members and said, it's not happening. You need to conduct a GAO study to actually show us what we already know. And thus the data came out saying, no, in fact, women were not being included in clinical trials. It was not happening. So they used it as a bit of a, you know, stick to go back and say, okay, we need to make this a policy. This has to become a mandate. 
Um, so to me, it was a really interesting case study to reflect on in terms of knowing about a problem and then figuring out what was going to be the right lever to pull to actually change uh, what happened. Next slide, please. So this is a uh, slide that's certainly near and dear to my heart, but um, Esther, I know it is near and dear to your heart because it is um, sort of a road that travels through um, faster cures, but you know a number of other patient organizations. And it actually builds off of some of the movements that I talked about, the HIV movement, um, you have venture philanthropy organizations, you have you know groups like PCORI that are created, um, and agencies that are doing, you know, phenomenal work, such as the FDA. You have um, cohorts that are created, the All of Us cohort at NIH, uh, the 21st Century Cures Act. You know, it it is this slide, I think, a um, an acknowledgement by the entire community that it is possible to build the plane while you are flying it that we didn't have all the answers about patient centricity, we did not have all the methodologies defined, but there was a willingness to go forward. Now, I think the same uh, tactics were deployed. There was a bit of a push and a bit of a pull, um, but I think that in a way we've probably, uh, you know, sat down and broken bread together more quickly and didn't have to necessarily go take to the streets to do um, some of the activism that we've seen in the past. Um, but but I do want us to reflect on the fact that um, some of this was, you know, done before we knew all the answers. Um, so next slide, please. So what do we take forward? And I had to throw our um, friend, the coronavirus, on there because, you know, we're going to be taking some of these lessons learned forward, whether we like it or not. Uh, the first one is this concept of nothing about us without us. Um, you know, it. It actually is a very old phrase that uh, originated in um, politics in Eastern Europe. It was brought into the disability rights movement, um, meeting people where they are front and center right now with COVID and health equity issues. The second, passion plus fearlessness equals change. Um, you know, we need to take all of this passion that we have and knowledge in this uh, convening and the the many, many times we have talked and studied this issue and actually create some change and not be afraid of that. Uh, third is that outside in strategy using, if you can go back one minute, um, using a little bit of the force and the strategy to create, exert, you know, push the pressure on the system. Coalition of the willing, number four, is really thinking broadly about who else needs to be, you know, brought in and give them assignments. And then fifth is using that disruption as a wedge. Um, you know, take the things that we've learned in COVID and that we're, you know, sort of having to live with and use them as a leapfrog. And the last slide is just kind of a, another summary of, of what I just said in terms of, you know, on that funding piece, I, I really got fatigued in the patient uh, movement where it was like, let's get the patient organizations to do it without any money. So let's be really mindful of who are we assigning what and pay them for what they need to be paid for. Um, and then really, you know, I want to bring up a point that Silas brought up of making sure that we are thinking about, um, you know, the pipeline of scientists, of clinicians, of healthcare workers, um, and thinking about that as well as everything else that I brought up. Thank you, guys. This was fun to go back and reflect on uh, my time capsule. Appreciate it. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mark. A really uh, excellent presentation and nice travel through uh, time. I, I, I'd really like to, uh, again, just thank all three of our speakers, really, for sharing your insights, your perspectives, uh, excellent and enjoyable presentations. And uh, I wish we could have given you more time, but uh, that was all uh, that was uh, provided. So, but I do think uh, your three presentations really provide the perfect segue into our next uh, set of breakouts. And uh, the breakout uh, sessions that we'll be moving into now have uh, two uh, discussion uh, periods. Uh, the first question uh, we'll be asking you to address is what are the one to two long-term tangible and measurable goals to ensure a more person-centered and inclusive clinical trials enterprise that should be met within the next 10 years? Our earlier session uh, focused on short term uh, being the next five years. And in the next session, we'll be focusing on the next 10 years. 
and what technologies, tools, or techniques could be transformational to improving inclusiveness and equity in the clinical trials enterprise over the, uh, the next